Good Sunday morning to you, and hope you've had a great Labor Day weekend up to this point. And God bless you again, and thank you for always taking time to join in with us. We consider it an honor and a pleasure to have you with us each Sunday. And uh, if you hadn't been checking us out on Wednesday night, we're continuing to put in a Bible study out on Wednesday night and a short devotion on Friday morning. So once again, I pray that you've had a good week. I want to say uh, to you from the bottom of my heart, thank you for already doing a great job supporting the food drive for the Baptist Children's Home. We've already taken up several items. We're storing them up in the fellowship hall, and many of you have been by here and donated. Some of you have set your stuff inside, and we thank you so much for that. God will continue to bless your generosity, and I know that he will use these items to bless those that need it most. And also want to tell you, um, as we prepare to open the doors back up on October the 4th, Please be in much prayer for that. Be in prayer for myself and the deacons as we figure out how we need to lay everything out for that to work, and then we will be back in contact with you, and hopefully we'll share a video with you as to what doors you can come in and what time you need to be here a little bit early to get filed in and those type, uh, just just minor things. The, the great thing is that we're going to be able to be back in God's house worshiping Him together and we have uh, some baptisms to look forward to as well. So I'm much excited about that. The title of our message today is Crisis of Good and Evil. And I know that you feel that in the midst of the turmoil that we're in right now. Uh, and God says a lot about that in His Word. But before we get into that, let's go to Him with a word of prayer. And let's uh, invite Him to just bathe our hearts, our minds, our souls, and get us ready to worship. Pray with me, will you? Heavenly Father, we just thank you again for another beautiful Sunday. We thank you for the blessings of, of a new week, Lord. And we are very thankful for living in a country that, that we have the freedoms to work and not only provide for our families, but also put back some funds to, to do things that we enjoy and, and save for a rainy day, so to speak, Lord. And we thank you for all those that work tough jobs and uh, work 40 hours plus each and every week to provide the needs of others. Uh, they don't have to do that, Lord. They could find a different way, but we just pray that we would do that in reverence to you, dear God, that we would work with a smile upon our faces, that we would want to provide not only for our families, but the families of others. There's so many farmers in our church and in our communities. There's many others that work in all facets of life that, that really we can't even comprehend how much those jobs touch other jobs, Lord. So we just thank you for that. We're thankful for the network that we're in and, and how everything works together for your good in accordance to your word, as we find in Romans 8, 28. Lord, we just ask that you would just bathe our hearts right now. Help us to slow down from the busyness of this past week and help us to focus upon you as we study from, from the book of Isaiah. And Lord, many of the things that we will read today, it mirrors and mimics exactly what's going on in our world today. So we pray that we can focus upon that, that we will get out of our hum-ho day-to-day routines, Lord, and we would reflect upon you and what you're doing in our lives and, and how we can do more and more. The abilities that you've given us and the blessings that you've continued to, to lay down upon us, Lord, we can use them to bless others. And we could be happy about doing it as well. So go with us now through our message. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. As we begin this morning, I want to tell you, first of all, I, as I was putting this message together and I began reading all the way back in Isaiah chapter 1, kind of reiterating the, the positives and negative things that what Isaiah was going through, really I had my mindset on looking at Isaiah chapter 6 and talking about the calling of Isaiah and, and what he went through. And you remember he, he said those famous words, here my Lord send me, and, and, and meaning that he would go. But as I got there and I began to, to, to read and, and reminisce from what I've known from my childhood up until now about the book of Isaiah, there were some things that just really struck a chord with me and I felt like I couldn't get to chapter 6 unless I took some time to really focus on chapter 5. So we're going to be 
in chapter 5 of Isaiah's book here. But before we get there, because I'm going to tell you some things today that you already know, that you've reflected upon many, many times, but we need to reiterate them so we can see exactly what God's doing, not only in Isaiah's time, but in our time as well. So I found a couple verses in 2 Peter chapter 1 that I think will help us remind ourselves of that. And it says, Therefore, I will always remind you about these things. So meaning that I'm going to tell them to you again, even though you know them, but we need to be reminded because I did. It says, Even though you already know them and are standing firm in the truth that you have been taught, and it's only right that I should keep on reminding you as long as I live. I take that as a challenge to me today that I would keep on reminding you as our congregation from New Home that the precepts of God, they are worthy to be followed. That, that we must each and every day take a long hard look of ourselves in the mirror and see if we are following what God intends for us to be doing as Christians. Number one, are we, are we living a life with a smile upon our faces knowing that God is in control? Maybe you've been through some challenges this week, and I want to tell you that we have. Lisa has had several tests, and, and we went on Thursday for a CT scan of her thyroid area and the tissues in front of that, and everything was, was wonderful. It was great. She got a clean bill of health. So we, we thank you so much for your prayers. And many of you are going through testing or maybe you're waiting test. But you know, God is in control. He hears us when we pray. He knows our struggles even before we get to them. But sometimes we get so busy in our day-to-day -day walk that we're not focusing upon Him. So some of the things that I'm going to tell you this morning is about the uncertainty of chaotic times that we think are maybe the worst in history but they're not. Many times we think our current situations are more traumatic and difficult than those times that our ancestors had to deal with. But take courage. God is in control. He's still leading. He, he hasn't relinquished His grip upon the throne, and He knows what we're going through. Not only do we find these wonderful stories of biblical struggles in God's Word, God has not only led them back to Him, but they've, He's led our own nation back to know Him, back from, from struggles, and back to prominence even after the plagues of the early 1900s, even after the Great Depression, and even after, more notably for our lifetimes, the events of 9-11. And I want to tell you this morning that God possesses the great power to faithfully lead us over and over and over again. And I pray that you feel that. But whether or not He does that really depends upon what you and I do with God. No matter how chaotic our struggles, no matter how we focus upon the good and the bad, no matter where we focus our time, if we get our focus off of God, then He will not be a blessing unto us. Isaiah lived in a nation in a severe spiritual and moral crisis, much like we feel like we're living in today. The people's defiance and, and their moral disintegration had left God no choice but to bring His wrath down upon them. And Isaiah had preached to the people. He had certainly attempted to persuade them tirelessly but they just wouldn't listen. And even if they did listen, they were not repenting from their evil ways. So as we begin in chapter 5, verse 1, Isaiah is trying to reach them with a type of folk song. And in the King James, he calls them his beloved people. Now, a lot of ministers like myself, they use that word beloved or beloved. Well, it comes, it gets its start right here in Isaiah. So look with me together in Isaiah chapter 5, beginning in verse 1, and let's see this song that I'm talking about. He says, Now I will sing for the one I love a song about his vineyard. And here's the song. My beloved had a vineyard 
on a rich and fertile hill. He plowed the land and cleared its stones and planted it with the best vines. In the middle, he built a watchtower, and he carved a wine press in the nearby rocks. Then he waited for a harvest of sweet grapes, but the grapes that grew were bitter. Now you people of Jerusalem and Judah, you judge between me and my vineyard. What more could I have done for my vineyard that I have not already done? When I expected sweet grapes, why did my vineyard give me bitter grapes? Now let me tell you what I will do to my vineyard. I will tear down its hedges. I will let it be destroyed. I will break down its walls and let the animals trample it. I will make it a wild place where the vines are not pruned and the ground is not hoed, a place overgrown with briars and thorns. I will command the clouds to drop no rain upon it. The nation of Israel is the vineyard of the Lord of heaven's armies. The people of Judah are his pleasant garden. He expected a crop of justice, but instead he found oppression. He expected to find righteousness, but instead he heard cries of violence. Let's not overlook what he's saying here. He expected to find justice. He expected to find righteousness. You know, those are two things that are in short supply in today's society. Justice and righteousness. Sometimes we tend to go along with whatever the crowd says is okay. But when God can't find justice and righteousness, then He's going to render down and make someone or something as an example. As He sang this song to His people, you will find that these, this song right here of restoration lines right up with what we knew that Jesus told in Matthew, the parable of the evil farmers in Matthew chapter 21, verses 33 through 44. You know, Isaiah had a very strong and heavy weight upon his shoulders for a people that were sinful, that would not listen, that began to accept all the wrongs in their lives as right. And we're going to read here in just a moment how the people saw wrong is right and right is wrong. Man, there's something very, very difficult about that. And as I was reading down through here this, this wonderful song, he's, he's talking about the vineyard. He's talking about the wonderful and good things that he has prepared, not only for the people in that day, but for us, his people in today's times. But yet, we have become a sinful people. We focus too much upon ourselves and we get out of God's precepts and we say we can do it on our own, don't we? But you know, after Isaiah went through this song, now he's got to come back and he's got to tell them that the people are guilty of God's judgment. And then he begins in verse 8 to share God's judgment. So go there with me, and we'll quickly, we won't read every word, but I don't want to leave much of this out. And during this time of reading about his judgment and the weight of Isaiah having on his shoulders to, to tell the people what's going to occur, we will find the seven woes that brought the judgment on the people, upon God's chosen people, by the way, and we would call them the bitter or the wild grapes. So let's look together beginning in verse 8. And I want to tell you before we read there, in verse 8, it says, What sorrow or woe unto them? And you see it again in verse 11, in verse 18, verse 19, verse 20, verse 21, and 22. And that is where you will find the seven woes. Beginning in verse 8, What sorrow for you who buy up a house after house and field after field until everyone is evicted and you live alone in the land. But I have heard the Lord of heaven's armies swear a solemn oath. Many houses will stand deserted. Even beautiful mansions will be empty. And then he's telling them that your lands won't be productive anymore. He's saying that you will plant 10 acres of a vineyard for only harvesting of six gallons of wine. Then he says you take 10 baskets of seed 
Men, that'd be like you and I planting 10 bags of seed and only harvesting one simple bag or one bushel. That would be a, an act of futility, so to speak. And then in verse 11, he says, What sorrow for those who get up early in the morning looking for a drink of alcohol and spend long evenings drinking wine and making themselves flaming drunk. They furnish wine and lovely music at their grand parties, lyre, harp, tambourine, and flute, but they never think about the Lord. He's saying that you focus more on your drinking than you focus upon your Lord. And you don't notice what he's doing. He says, so my people will go into exile far away because they do not know me. He goes on to say that those who are great and honored will starve to death. They won't have food or drink because they tried to be leaders, but yet they forgot God. They left him out. Then in verse 16, it says, but the... Lord of heaven's armies will be exalted by his justice. Now, we've seen that many times, and Isaiah uses that term, Lord of heaven's armies, 25 or so times in this book. He goes on to say, The holiness of God will be despised by his righteousness. In that day, lambs will find good pastures, and fattened sheep and young goats will feed among the ruins. Why is that? Because the people won't be there. The animals have it to run rapid, all that they want to. So in verses 8 and 10, we've seen the, the grasping of materialism. Just like us, we want more and more and more. Give me, give me, give me. And then what we just read through 11 through 17 is talking about the drunkenness, the dependency and the pleasure seeking. Then the woe, the, the third woe is in Verse 18, for what sorrow for those who drag their sins behind them with ropes made of lies, who drag wickedness behind them like a cart. Now, I hope we can stop here just a moment and you can get this picture. That would be like you and I having a trailer behind us with all our lies, with all our sins, with all the filthiness in our hearts, and we've got a rope tied to it and we're pulling it along with us wherever we go. He's saying that the, the people of, of this day, of Isaiah's day, they were just pulling along those sins everywhere they went. They had no choice but to drag them along with them. Why? Because they lived that lifestyle day to day. They were not getting down upon their knees and repenting of their sins. They were just living with it. A wagon load of iniquity. They had such defiant sinfulness that they began to look away, to turn a blind eye. They didn't even feel it in their hearts when they sinned any longer. Then the number four woe is found in verse 19. They even mock God and say, hurry up and do something. We want to see what you can do. Let the Holy One of Israel carry out his plan, for we want to know what it is. Friend, making a mockery of God is extremely dangerous. We never tempt the Lord our God. You and I would never want to put our lives in harm's way intentionally feeling that God was going to spare us. We don't tempt God that way. We don't say, hurry up, God, where are you? Are you not working? No, we know He's working, and we must continue to be reverent. Look in verse 20 at woe number 5. For what sorrow for those who say that evil is good and good is evil. This is moral perversion. That the dark is light and the light is dark. That bitter is sweet and sweet is bitter. This is referred to as talking with a Forked tongue, so to speak. A generation of forked tongue people right here. The saying, right is wrong and wrong is right. Does that sound familiar? That's what we are experiencing all around us each and every day. Don't get caught up in that. Don't get pulled and sucked into that, believing or maybe understanding differently than what God's Word teaches. 
sugarcoating the message of sin and deceit. That's what many ministers do. Praise God that we live in, in an area where the Bible is proclaimed mightily, and we don't have someone telling you things that aren't in line with God's Word. The whole idea of, of modest, modestly telling you that it's okay to sin, you can just ask for forgiveness, it's okay not to support your local church, it's okay to drink and hang out as long as you go to church on Sundays, or how about this, everything's going to work for good, and you're going to make plenty of money, and you're going to be prosperous. It doesn't say that in the Bible. It does say everything works for good for those who love God and are called according to His purposes. But don't misunderstand the perversion of morality. Let's look at Woe 6, found in verse 21. What sorrow for those who are wise in their own eyes and think themselves so clever. You know, we live in such a corrupt society that we can back up right there and we can say evil is good and good is evil, and we can say it's okay for us to participate. Meaning that if you work somewhere and you're illegally picking up some things, maybe it's a pen, a pencil, paper clips, and you're deliberately taking them home with you, man, that's stealing. You can't sugarcoat that. That's wrong. That should make you want to take it all back, make it all right, because you didn't have permission to take those items. He's saying here, we, they, like us, they make themselves seem clever and wise in whose eyes? Certainly not God's eyes, in their own eyes. And finally, the number seven woe, beginning in verse 22. What sorrow for those who are heroes at drinking wine. Well, we've already talked about drunkenness, but it says they boast about all the alcohol they can hold. They take bribes to let the wicked go free, and they punish the innocent. Now, I don't want to throw off on a certain group or class of people, but sometimes if you're a, if you're a salesman, if you're a person that works with the public, and you think that you must quote, unquote, wine and dine people to get their business, this is what he's touching on right here. Man, you are called to be a leader. You don't have to do that. You don't have to bow down to do things that you know are wrong, unethical, and immoral in order to get business. God will bless you for doing what's right, I promise. You don't have to stoop to that. But as we look at these, we see that the men, the leaders of that day, they were arrogant and conceited. They were boastful. And instead of listening to God, the leaders, they consulted between themselves and made their own decisions. And once they made those decisions, then the leadership was corrupt. I looked up some scripture verses found in Romans chapter 1, verses 21 through 23. And I want to read them to you for a minute, and this will help reiterate this point it says yes they knew God but they wouldn't worship him as God or even give him thanks and they began to think up foolish ideas of what God would li was like as a result their minds became dark and confused claiming to be wise they instead became utter fools and instead of worshiping the glorious ever-living God they worshiped idols made to look like mere people and birds and animals and reptiles. You know, corrupt leadership is nothing more than the lack of integrity, the lack of honesty, the lack of virtue. Virtue meaning that you know what's right and knowing that you should go to all ends to do it, all means necessary to do what's right, yet you go along with the group instead. The very leaders here who were supposed to enforce the law, they were guilty of, as the Scripture says, punishing the innocent and letting the wicked go free. What happens when you do that? More and more wickedness. I don't understand the whole idea that, that the riots and all are, are, are focusing on right now. 
there may be some good reasons to riot. I get that. But when we begin to, to burn our homes, our, our places of business, our towns up, that's just evilness. And if those people call themselves leaders and they're doing that, then that's just pulling you and I towards the devil's agenda and not towards what God would like to see happen. And I'm sad to say that our politicians today and many other people, they look to pad their own pockets. They look to take bribes according to the word here in order to support themselves instead of promoting justice. Isaiah warned that these corrupt politicians would be brought down by the justice of Almighty God. So there you have the seven woes, the grasping of materialism, the drunkenness, the defiant sinfulness, the making a mockery of God. Number five was the, poor, the moral perversion. Number six, arrogant conceit and boastful pride. And finally, the last one, corrupt leadership. You know, God continues to take very seriously our sinful ways. He gives us opportunities to admit our sins and to cry out for forgiveness. And if we will not repent, then He cannot pardon or forgive us. And judgment, just like we read right here, is certainly on the wise. So you may be saying, well, Isaiah sang them the song. He told them what they were doing. Well, what's the next step? And that's what we want to read on 24 and 25. This is their punishment for the people of Israel at that point. In 24 it says, Therefore, just as fire licks up stubble and dry grass shrivels in the flame, so their roots will rot and their flowers wither. For they have rejected the law of the Lord of heaven's armies. And this is why they're being punished. They have despised the word of the Holy One of Israel. That is why the Lord's anger burns against His people, and why He has raised His fist to crush them. The mountains tremble, and the corpses of His people litter the streets like garbage. But even then... The Lord's anger is not satisfied. His fist is still poised to strike. Friend, this is giving us a great mental picture of exactly what God can and will do to a nation who no longer respects Him, who no longer values His teachings, His book, His word, who no longer values the instance and opportunities to pray on a daily basis and ask for simple forgiveness. This should be extremely eye-opening to us. And although we, as, a, as the United States of America, what we consider the, the greatest nation on the face of this earth, but we are not God's chosen people. Why do you and I think that He would excuse our sinfulness? He certainly did not for His own people. And He will not for us. He has blessed us in so many ways, but yet we get our eyes off of Him and we get our focus on us. He is not obligated to bless us any longer. I pray that He does. I hope you pray the same. But we have turned away from God in so many ways and I personally feel that we will suffer consequences because of it. But take heart. God's grace, God's love, the fact that God is always right, He holds a remnant of believers and He will bring us to the forefront of the minds of others if we will but follow the teachings that we know are right and not corrupt ourselves. And when He does that, he can work wonders. He can bring back plants from, from a fiery death. Now, I know a lot about plants. And I know that the root system below the surface, 
is just as important as the plant growing above the surface. And many times the roots down below, although they may be fibrous or may have a large tap root, they may be just as large as what's growing up above. But you know what? When the top gets cut off or burned out, as the Scriptures say, then the roots may die as well. But what happens next? Have you ever seen a forest that's been burned clean? Over a period of time, some green starts pushing back through. This is the remnant of God's people. This is a perfect example of you and I to be that remnant. To even though all those around us don't believe in what God can do, and don't want to follow Him, and want to participate in the, the ways of the world, the worldly way, keep standing upon God. Keep being that one blade of green grass growing back where it looked as if everything was tarnished and burnt up. We can come back for, from the fiery judgment and praise His holy name, and be stronger than ever. And then it's really, really good to go all the way back to a very, very notable Scripture found in 2 Chronicles chapter 7, beginning in verse 14. And here's where we want to close. And I know that you know this Scripture verse. You've seen it. You've heard it. If you listen to... The radio any, they play it from time to time. But then it says these words, Then if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, I will hear from heaven, I will forgive their sins and restore their land. But let's don't stop there. Let's go a little further. My eyes will be open and my ears attentive to every prayer made in this place, for I have chosen this temple and I've set it apart to be holy, a place where my name will be honored forever, and I will watch over it, for it is dear to my heart. But then look in verse 19. But if you or your descendants abandon me and disobey the decrees and commands I have given you, and if you serve and worship other gods, then what's it say? A big lump in our throats right here then I will uproot the people from this land that I have given them. I will reject this temple that I have made holy to honor my name. I will make it an object of mockery and ridicule among the nations. If we abandon God, then He will abandon us. But if we draw close into Him, we will be like those sprigs that you just seen in that picture. Those wonderful blades growing strong out of the midst of chaos. And that's who God intends for us to be. This should be a good lead in to our message for next week found in Isaiah chapter 6. I pray that you'll join with us again as we talk about Isaiah's calling and about the fact that, that he said, I'm a man of filthy lips, among a people with filthy lips. But here am I, Lord, send me. Let's close in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this message. We thank you for the Scripture verses, and we've read many of them. Lord, I pray that we are not a people that will continue to turn away from you. I pray that we will get back on track and draw closer to you than we ever have been in the past. Lord, there's so many evil things around us that, that just draws us in. And we know that the devil wants to make them look prosperous and, and fun and enjoyable. And we know without a doubt that there's pleasure in sin for a short season because your word says that. But Lord, I pray that we can be strong, that we can... We can man up and we can bear our burdens strong enough not to fall into those traps. Lord, we, we have made a mockery of your name as a nation. And we need forgiveness. We need forgiveness more than we ever have. And I pray that there is 
just enough of us out there that are Christians that want to have others come along beside of us and find the joys of life in doing what's right, that we would stand strong and firm on your word and that you would hear our prayers and that you would heal our remarkable land back to what it can be and what it will be according to your promises. Father God, bless our people. Bless each and every person that is hearing this message today. And Lord, challenge them to get back in your word. For all these things we ask in Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. Thank you again for joining in with us. and hope you have a great Labor Day tomorrow.